afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. Thank you very, very much for joining us this afternoon for the next in our 2009-2010 Millennium Lecture Series. This afternoon's lecture is co-sponsored by UTEP's Office of Research and Sponsored Programs and the College of Engineering. Thanks to Vice President Roberto Segueda and Dean Richard Schoporster for their support. The theme of this year's Millennium Lecture Series has been contemporary issues, and our focus this month has been on energy resources and sustainability. Our distinguished speakers are sharing with us their perspectives on these complex and increasingly pressing issues, which are certain to shape the future of our lives across the globe for generations to come. With us today is Dr. Raymond Orbach, director of the University of Texas at Austin's Energy Institute. The institute was formed to develop multidisciplinary research programs and educational materials to overcome the scientific and technological barriers to a secure and sustainable energy future. In addition, the Texas Energy Institute is also concerned with helping policy leaders reach the informed decisions required to achieve that goal. Clearly, there can be few individuals as qualified for such an ambitious mission as Dr. Orbach. When he served as the U.S. Department of Energy's first Undersecretary for Science and Director of the Office of Science, Dr. Orbach administered the department's role in technology transfer coordination and policy and led management oversight and support of numerous academic and publicly funded research laboratories nationwide. He became the go-to guy in the world of energy science and was certainly one of the very few scientists with the immense breadth of experience to pull that off. After earning a bachelor's degree at Caltech and a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, both in physics, Dr. Orbach served as a postdoctoral fellow at Oxford University. He began his academic career at Harvard and later served as professor of physics at UCLA. In an extraordinary career of research in theoretical and experimental physics, he has published more than 240 scientific papers and received far too many national and international academic awards, appointments, and fellowships to be able to begin to tell you about them here. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he serves on some 20 professional scientific and civic boards. In addition, he served higher education in a leadership capacity as chancellor of the University of California at Riverside, from 1992 to 2002. In his current role at UT Austin's Energy Institute, Dr. Orbach will facilitate what he has called a mobilizing collaboration among talented scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurial thinkers in both academe and the private sector. We are indeed fortunate to have this opportunity to hear Dr. Orbach's highly informed perspectives on energy security from deal killers to game changers. Ray? Thank you, President Natalicio. That was a very generous introduction, and I'm very grateful to you. It's a great pleasure to be here at last. I was supposed to be here on February 9th uh, to deliver uh, a lecture with the same title, but uh, United Airlines and the snow in Washington, D.C. conspired to keep me away, and uh, at last I finally got here. And so it's with great pleasure that I have actually updated the talk but that I finally have the opportunity to visit again UTEP and, and work with the faculty and the president and her staff uh, today and people from the community at this wonderful institution. I've been here a number of times as a physicist and now it's a great pleasure to come here as a speaker. My talk today is really focused on energy security. 
and what I call the deal killers, that if we don't fix, we will fail in the pursuit of that terribly important target of opportunity. There are five deal killers that I will talk about. I won't dwell greatly on all of them, but I want to list them because in my view, they represent the challenges to which we have to address ourselves uh, if we are to preserve this globe as we currently know it. The first, of course, is global warming and the issue of CO2 emissions of, that are very likely, and I'll define that in a moment, responsible for it. CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for about 200 years. And so what we put up there today will be there for our descendants for quite some time. As you are well aware, the CO2 concentration has been increasing over historical values. And the dynamics are such that if, even if we stopped today and produced no more CO2 in the atmosphere, it would continue to increase for another couple of decades. Uh, what the right number is, nobody knows. But prudence, I would argue, would dictate that we pay attention and where we can reduce the CO2 emissions from our planet. Intermittent energy sources are important because in most cases they are essentially carbon free. The difficulty is that they're intermittent. And what we need to do is to invent ways of storing electricity so that when the wind doesn't blow or the sun doesn't shine, we have that resource to make use of. You're well aware that in Texas, the wind tends to blow at night and we need the energy during the day and even worse during the summer when we really need it, there's no wind. Um, the issue here is penetration. How much wind power can the grid absorb? And I'll be talking about ways of enhancing that through electrical energy storage. But right now, it's a deal killer. Without it, wind cannot be more than 20% of our baseload capacity. The third topic is biofuels, which you've heard a lot about and which, in principle, are carbon neutral. The difficulty is that nature has so designed plants that we simply are unable to turn the cellulose inside the plant cell wall uh, into the fuels that we need for transportation. And I'll talk about ways of dealing with that deal killer. Uh, the fourth is one that people talk about, but really we don't have a way of accomplishing. That's something that nature has been doing for four billion years, taking CO2, sunlight, and hydrogen and making fuel, it's ATP, which is the plant's fuel. But we have not been able to figure out a way to harness the vast amount of solar energy that strikes the surface of the Earth and create the fuels that we would need for transportation or for commerce, and I'll talk about that. Finally, the only truly carbon-free generation of electricity that we have today is nuclear energy. But 30 years ago, we decided as a nation not to reprocess spent fuel. And all of you are aware that this administration has decided that Yucca Mountain uh, is not an acceptable storage site for spent fuel from nuclear reactors. So as of this point in time, we have no place and no method to deal with spent fuel. You can't reprocess it, and you can't put it in the ground, so it only accumulates. It's nasty stuff, but it's full of energy. But it is the Achilles heel of the nuclear energy uh, world. If we can't figure out what to do with spent fuel, we will eventually kill that opportunity for carbon-free energy. So those are the deal killers. What are the game changers? Well, we're working on ways of storing carbon dioxide in aquifers, saline aquifers, uh, underneath the earth, 10,000 feet down. Um, 
as we will see, the cost of doing that is prohibitive. And indeed, there is no sequestration project in the world at scale for large pulverized coal-fired power plants. None. With all the language that people have used over the past 10 years. Electrical energy storage is still not available, but we have some ideas about new kinds of batteries that will be able to store electrical energy at base load levels. That is, so it really matters uh, for electrical energy production. We are using genetics to modify the plant cell wall to loosen the lignans, which are the protection of the plant and its strength from the cellulose, which is inside, in order to produce fuel. Cellulose is um, pure sugar. Cotton is pure cellulose. But my shirt, nor yours, doesn't dissolve if you put it in the water. And the reason is that the sugars in cellulose are in the form of a very powerful polymer, very difficult to break down. Uh, fortunately for us, that's the case. Unfortunately for fuel, we need those sugars in order to produce fuel. I'm not talking about ethanol. I'm talking about gasoline or diesel, real fuels. And once we have the sugars, we have methods uh, through catalytic processes of producing hydrocarbons of sufficient carbon number to really make a difference for transportation. But right now, we don't know how to separate the lignans from the cellulose so that our enzymes can get through in order to reduce the cellulose to sugars. The use of solar energy, which is so tempting, there is, in a single hour, the amount of sunlight striking the Earth in one hour is equal to the total energy consumption of the world in a year. And yet, right now, solar energy comprises less than 0.1% of our energy budget. So it's there, but we don't know how to use it. And the issue is one that nature solved by this very complex photosynthetic process. Namely, when a photon is absorbed, it takes a electron hole pair and splits it. That is, it takes an electron, we call it a reducing electron, away from its opposite charge, that hole, and miraculously, at room temperature, translates in space that electron to a reduction center, a redox center, where it can do chemistry. But it hasn't got enough energy. It has to wait for a second reduction electron to arrive at that redox center so that some of the two photon energies can do chemistry. It's quite remarkable. But if you've ever seen Photosystem II, that protein that does the work, you'll understand how complex that is. Can we do the same thing? Can we synthetically, without plants and without microbes, take sunlight, CO2, and water and produce fuel? The answer is no, but we're working on it. And I will talk about some opportunities that I believe are there and actually that are being pursued on this campus as well. And finally, closing the nuclear fuel cycle in order to take the energy that is contained in spent fuel and use it for generation of electricity. I will go through the steps that, in fact, make this an obvious process. The difficulty is proliferation because it induces uh, fissionable material at very large scale. And that was indeed what led President Carter to stop our uh, uh, reprocessing program in the United States. It didn't stop Britain, France, Russia, India, China, uh, Japan from doing reprocessing. In fact, as near as I can tell, it didn't stop anybody from doing reprocessing except ourselves. And we invented the reprocessing process. But the only persons that are hurt are you and me. So is it time to revisit that decision? And I'll leave that up to you to decide. Although I've, 
obviously a, an opinion on it. So let's talk about deal killer number one. I referred to the IPCC AR4 report, and with all of the nonsense that's out there with regard to climate gate, these two statements, I think, are still there and are backed by the best science that we know how to do. The first one is that warming of our planet is unequivocal. There's no issue. It is warming. The second is that you and I are very likely, and they were very careful in how they put that statement together, responsible for that warming. Now, they define very likely as using expert judgment and greater than 90%. But there is the 10% possibility that it's not true. And so you can place your bets wherever you like. You can say it's not true and bet on that, but I'm going to bet on the 90% probability that it's true. I think it's just prudent to deal with CO2 issues as a matter of probabilities. It is true that we cannot predict very accurately, long-term climate, because, frankly, it's a hard problem, and our computers aren't big enough. They will be in four or five years. But right now, there are lots of unknowns. So my perspective is one of prudence. What do you do in order to increase your odds of being successful? Um, is it as bad as I say? Well, here is a projection from the um, EIA, that's a part of the Department of Energy. And if you look at coal on the very bottom, you will see that they project an increase in the CO2, um, or I should say in the energy usage of coal, and the next one will have the CO2, out to 2030. So with all of the concern over CO2, it continues to increase. You see that renewables and biofuels are increasing, and that's fine. But notice that the total amount of energy is increasing that we use. So what's happening is that the coal is not going away. Well, that coal, the far right, produces two gigatons of CO2 each year. And as you are well aware, China has just passed us and is now producing even more than we are. China is building one new pulverized coal-fired power plant a week. We have over 500 churning away in the United States. You can build all of the renewable energy sources you like. You can do lots of different things. But if you don't fix the pulverized coal-fired power plants that are there now, it doesn't make any difference. They are responsible for the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere, and they'll be churning away. So you've got to deal with what's there rather than simply invent new ways and clean ways of producing your electricity, which is also important. I don't mean to minimize it. But you've got to deal with what's there. What's the game changer? Well, I won't go through all of these, and I passed out my notes so that you can read these uh, if you wish. But there are four basic components to carbon capture. It's called CCS, carbon capture and storage. The capture, the compression, transportation, and sequestration. As we will see, the first two consume a third of the power plant's energy currently. And so they're simply not economic. Now, you can argue that we may have a tax on carbon or a cap and trade on carbon. That's fine. I'm not going to deal with those. I want to talk about what really works in an open, competitive environment. So right now, it's not competitive. And what are the barriers? And I've listed a large number of barriers. The very bottom one is one that people don't talk much about. But I bring it to your attention because it's probably as important as every, everything else, and that is public understanding of what you mean by sequestration. Of course, what we're talking about is pumping CO2 into saline aquifers, as I said, down about 10,000 feet. There was a very excited article in Der Spiegel about a year ago about a major utility in Germany 
that was proposing on its own dime, but just to show it could be done, to pump CO2 into a saline aquifer 2,500 meters below the good citizens of Ketsin. Ketsin is a small town on the outskirts of Potsdam near Berlin. That was last year. This year, the Wall Street Journal had headlines about an inch high of the good citizens of Ketsin revolting against any possibility of sequestering CO2. The Greens, who had no love for coal, convinced the people of Ketsin that the CO2 could leak and suffocate them. Chances of that are modest. In fact, in my view, zero, but nevertheless, the citizens of Ketsin would not allow the trucks to come forward for the drilling. Not only that, the Bundestag was never able to pass a law regulating CO2 sequestration. And we've given that a name. We call it NUMBI, not under my backyard. People have to understand what it is we're doing, what the risks are, if there are any, the best we can do to explain what this process is. If you don't do it, you will have a Ketsin phenomena, even though the issues behind it, everybody would subscribe to. Now, as I said, pulverized coal-fired power plants in the United States would use about a third of their energy to capture and pressurize the CO2. The thermodynamic limit is 12%. So you're never going to do better than that. And those of you who know your second law know that you'll never get there. And so the best we can do with mean liquids is typically 25 to 30%. Uh, there's a power plant near Austin in Fayette that has three pulverized coal-fired generators. And they were uh, requested to reduce their CO2. And they said, no problem. We can do that. We'll just shut one down. Well, that would reduce the CO2, but unfortunately, it doesn't produce any electricity. There's a possibility of recovering some of that cost. And this is something very new. This is something we're still working on. And anywhere you have a geothermal reservoir, high pressure, high temperature, that produces geothermal energy, you may well have a methane-saturated substrate. Methane is the first product that occurs when you have organic decay. And underneath Austin and that part of Texas is an aquifer that contains, we believe, about 230 trillion cubic feet of recoverable methane. That's about one-eighth of the total methane in the United States, both conventional and unconventional. It's huge. It's the way we used to produce natural gas. In the mid-80s, they'd drill into this aquifer, they'd pull up the saline li liquid, the methane would boil off, but the liquid was so saline, they had to pump it back down again. And the energy cost of pumping it up and pumping it down put them out of business. But it's still there. And so the concept then is actually it's even gotten more sophisticated, a closed loop where you would take the CO2 through the usual capture and pressurization. You would bring the brine from this geopressured formation up to the surface. You would pump the CO2 into that brine. It turns out the CO2 is about 10 times more soluble than methane. As a consequence, there's a phase separation, those of you who remember your ternary phase diagrams, and the methane comes off as a front. And so it just propagates out, and you can use it to generate more electricity. Then you pump the CO2-laden solution into the aquifer. It pressurizes an exit for the brine, and so it's a closed loop. If you don't do this, what happens when you just take CO2 and pump it in is that the pressure, back pressure, builds up. And we've shown through simulations that, in fact, you can't do it. It simply stops the CO2 sequestration. 
And so a lot of what you've heard about CCS is simply dead wrong. The beauty of this process is that it produces something that you can sell. And we've done a study of, for example, how much you could get. We just did a simulation. So what we did was we observed that the Fayette coal-fired power plant emits about 10 million tons of CO2 each year. And the simulation was for 42 million tons of CO2, or about four years of production from that source. And came up with a number of about $32 million worth of methane that you could produce. Now that's still not a lot and will never offset the full cost. But at least you have a way of permanently storing the CO2. It's soluble, it doesn't go away and of offsetting the cost as best you can do. We estimate you get about a 10 to 20% return. So at least it's a vehicle for keeping the pressure fixed, because you're just recirculating the liquid, and for recovering some of the cost. It's uh, what we hope will be a game changer. And we're working right now with the Lower Colorado River Authority to actually do a study, a real study, on the Fayette power plants and how we might sequester all of the CO2 and offset it with methane production. Can't tell you that it will work, but we're doing it as a business case. Second game cha changer is electrical energy storage. And I wish I could give you as much confidence in that as I could in the CO2. We simply don't know how to do it. If you look at the power versus the energy, power is the rate at which you deliver energy, you will see that batteries are quite effective for large amounts of energy storage, but very slow in producing that power. However, supercapacitors are very fast in delivering power, but don't store much energy. And so your car of the future, your electric car, will have both supercapacitors and batteries. The problem is that your current batteries take you about 80 miles, and that's it. Now, it's true you only drive 40 miles a day on the average, but it's not the average you're worried about. It's when you want to go on a 300-mile trip, and you've got 80 miles of range. Well, the problem is we simply do not know how to store enough electrical energy and batteries to give you that range. We still use the same batteries that Faraday used in the 19th century. The lead acid battery was one that he developed in his laboratory. It's two centuries later and we still haven't licked the problem. What are the game changers? Well, we've got to do something about the way we store electricity. Now, there's no way you can read this, but I hope that uh, what I passed out will be helpful. Uh, the first thing is to make the battery stable. Some of you may remember the Sony batteries and laptops that caught fire about six years ago. That was because their cathode, that's where you store all your energy, uh, caught fire. And so a um, remarkable man, John Goodenough, invented the lithium iron phosphate electrode. And if you uh, Google lithium ion batteries, the first paragraph lists John's name. Invented the cathode that you now use in your batteries that don't catch fire. So the first thing is to get architectures that are stable and safe. And that's still a problem. The anode is typically just a carbon anode. It's not very good, but that's all we have right now in our batteries. The second is to recognize that lithium has a single electron per ion, lithium plus. Why can't we use iron, or not iron, but uh, actually you could use iron. Why don't we use metals that have more than one electron in their valence? And I've given the example here of cobalt, which has two electrons. We could double the capacity of the battery. Or vanadium, increase it by a factor of four. Easy to say quite another matter to actually materialize, but there's also a possibility. Finally, why do we have to have solid electrodes? Your batteries, you remember when they used to leak? 
That was because the electrolyte, the thing that separates the cathode and the anode, was a liquid. Solid cathode, liquid electrolyte, solid anode. What if you had a liquid cathode, a solid electrolyte, and who cares about the anode? Think about that. The cathode is where the energy is stored, but it's a liquid. So what you could do when you're charging your battery, of course this would be huge, is to simply flow the liquid through when you charge it, when the wind is blowing. You change the electric energy into chemical energy, and then you pump it out and store it in a tank. Curiously enough, the hard part is not the liquid. The hard part is getting a solid electrolyte that will allow the ions to go through fast enough. And the answer is we don't know how to do it. But there is a problem in materials that hopefully has a solution. It would enable us to store electrical energy in sufficient quantities to really store at baseload levels the output of wind farms or, for that matter, of solar farms. So there is an opportunity to have a game changer, but there's very basic research that's required to be done. The supercapacitors are being developed very rapidly. And this is something that Faraday didn't have, namely nanotechnology. And I've given here the concepts behind it, namely, if you have very small particles, you have a lot of surface area. That surface area then gives you a very high capacitance. And by using nano methods, you can increase the capability of storage by many orders of magnitude. Some of you may have built radios when I was being uh, in that age range when we used to do that. And I remember the 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. The thing was a can about that big, microfarads. We are now building in the same volume 10 to 100 farads using uh, these uh, nanoparticles. Now there's problems about stability and so on, but we will be able to store huge amounts for very short times of electrical energy, giving us the kick that you want when you put your foot down on the accelerator in an electric car. So there are opportunities out there for game changers. They all require basic research, new concepts that can be brought to solve these major problems. Bioenergy is a tough one. I don't see any plants in here. But if you look at a plant, just think of the torque that that leaf exerts on the stem. If that were your arm and you scaled up, it would break your bones. Those lignans we refer to as liquid concrete. They are so strong that they give the plant the ability to grow straight up. They're there for a reason. The plant had all kinds of enemies, fungus, insects, all kinds of things. And that lignin layer on the outer part of the cell wall protects the foodstuff inside, that cellulose, from those enemies, which is great for the plant, but lousy for us if we want to get at that cellulose, which is nothing but sugar, and then use it to produce fuel. Now, this is a work in progress. What we're doing in this country is to take a look at the binding between the lignans and the cellulose from a microscopic perspective. We're taking a look at the genes in the plant that drive the metabolic pathways that produce that binding. Now, the way it's being done is to grow literally a thousand different varieties of switchgrass Notice which ones have the least coupling between the two, and then target the gene that's responsible for that. It's pretty primitive, but that's where we're at right now. And the metabolic pathways are even more difficult. Now, you're going to get very stubby trees and plants because it won't have the strength to grow straight up. On the other hand, it will be full of accessible cellulose. And we're looking at ionic liquids, which can then penetrate the lignin and break down the cellulose so that it's more easily attacked by enzymes and produce sugars. The sugars, once you have them, can be handled through catalytic methods and produce real hydrocarbons, 
six-membered, eight-membered, well, six-membered rings, which you can then uh, use uh, in various chemical methods to produce fuel. It looks something like this. You would grow uh, switchgrass or poplar trees, which we've now sequenced. We sequenced both, the switchgrass and the poplar trees. Uh, they would look a little stubby, but you'd have a plantation that would produce fuel. I haven't said a thing about food or water. You could grow these in saline environments. You wouldn't touch fuel or food. We can grow a billion dry tons of biomass a year in the United States without touching our food supply. That would replace, if we were successful, about a third of our transportation fuels. It's distributed. You could have a little refinery uh, in the presence of a plantation of stubby uh, poplar trees. It's possible, but first you have to understand the microscopics of how the lignin attaches to the cellulose and figure out a way of loosening it. So in that process then, you can go from lignocellulose to sugars, and then through catalytic methods, uh, move to real fuels. Again, a game changer, but requiring very basic research. What about hydrogen? I must say that in the last few months, I've learned a lot about hydrogen. And some of you may remember about five or six years ago, the hydrogen economy. It was proposed that we switch to hydrogen, that you use it in fuel cells to drive your car. The difficulty was you didn't know how to produce the hydrogen, you couldn't store the hydrogen, and the fuel cells didn't work. It wasn't a great idea. But it turns out that hydrogen is a great idea. In the chemical plants, for example, I've given a specific reference here to ConocoPhillips, they use 1.2 billion cubic feet of hydrogen a day to increase the octane rating of their fuels. And they're about 12 to 13 percent of the chemical industry. Now the way they do that is the way I've illustrated here. It's, uh, I've, there's actually two steps in here which I've collapsed into one. Namely, they reform natural gas, methane, uh, and water into hydrogen, and guess what? CO2. So for every four hydrogens you produce, you produce a molecule of CO2. You can do the math. I've told you how much hydrogen we produce, just figure out how much CO2 comes off. I'm told that if they could produce hydrogen without CO2, they would reduce the carbon footprint of their chemical plant by 30 to 40 percent. That's how much hydrogen they use and how much CO2 they produce. And then there was a note by somebody who did the analysis, hydrogen production produces more CO2 than by directly burning the methane. Um, so you got an idea of what's at store what's uh, at stake. Okay, how do you produce hydrogen without CO2? Well, this is how we're thinking about it. First of all, as I pointed out at the beginning, there's a lot of sunlight striking the Earth, and yet less than a tenth percent of our primary energy comes from sunlight. Is there a way to take that sunlight and produce what plants do? namely fuel, in this case hydrogen, by splitting water. The difficulty is that electron hole. You could absorb sunlight and produce an electron hole. That we know how to do. But before you know it, the two have recombined and produced heat. You've got to get that electron away from the hole and then do chemistry with it. Is there any way to do that and do it efficiently? It doesn't take much. You only need about 10% efficiency in order to make a huge difference, as I'll show. Well, this is how a photochemical cell, photoelectric, electrochemical cell works. Uh, the photon comes in. It generates that electron. And now this is all theoretical, except it actually happens. 
Uh, you produce oxygen with a hole. You transfer that electron to a metal electrode, and you produce hydrogen. Simple enough, except this is a very bulky way of doing it. You really want a compact structure. It would look like this, where you would have a solid, where you generate the electron hole pair. You'd have an anode and a cathode, and do catalytic methods to produce the oxygen and the hydrogen. Can we do that? Well, the group at Caltech, Nate Lewis, came up with the following concept. What's the trick? The trick is, first of all, to use cheap materials. And I'll show you why in a moment. Secondly, the trick is, don't take that electron very far. And so what you do is you use a nanorod to absorb the photon. Those are those vertical things. And then you take that electron, and instead of trying to do the chemistry on the nano rod, you transfer it away, in this case by using a two-dimensional uh, array, uh, tongue state, uh, and have it do chemistry. You don't want to do it over a long distance, and the nano scale enables you to get that electron out of there because it's not very big. Now, unfortunately, this was very inefficient, but there you go. He actually demonstrated the production of hydrogen from water synthetically. No plant material, no microbes, just doing it synthetically. Is there a way to do it with greater efficiency? Well, there's actually, the world's record actually is, now it's more, it's about 15%, came from this device where you had just what I showed you, namely a platinum electrode, uh, this is your PN junction. You shine light through the catalytic process into the junction that releases the electron hole pair. The hole goes here, the electron comes here, and you do chemistry. And this is actually what it looks like. And as you will see, the world's record is about, at that time, 12.4%. What's the problem? It's that platinum. <laughs> In order to meet the energy demands of the United States, for example, you would need that much surface area, which is a good part of western Texas, in order to generate that much power. Now, you all understand how big an area that is. You're not going to coat it with platinum. It just won't work. And so what we're looking at are much cheaper materials, metal oxides, that we can use instead of the platinum. Uh, and it's really very much like biology. Um, the people at Austin, for example, are taking two or three metals in oxide materials, maybe making a thousand different alloys, and then seeing which are most photochemically active. And they have a very dynamic and quick way of doing that, which is very clever. But that's the problem. Solar energy is powerful, but it's diffuse. And you've got to cover a very large surface area. Now, granted, that's a lot of, a lot of power. But nevertheless, you're not going to do it with platinum. And so, again, the basic research is, can you find a catalytic material which is cheap enough that you can cover that much land to produce that much power? The fifth area I want to talk about, I've skipped over it, is nuclear energy. And here, I think our country has the capability of doing this, but we have systematically declined the opportunity. First of all, nuclear energy is carbon free. Actually, if you take the carbon that you produce when you actually build it, it's still only about 10 or 12 percent carbon. Uh, generated as compared to, for example, 80% from oil or 100% from coal. So it's still a very good option. The difficulty is that spent fuel. But what does the spent fuel contain? It's plutonium. That's fissionable. Still has a percent of 235. The natural abundance is 7 tenths of a percent. That doesn't sound like much, but that's a substantial enrichment. It has neptunium. It has curium. These are all fissionable isotopes. 
it has some americium, which is fissionable, but which is nasty stuff, so you want to separate that out. You could take those four elements that I described and create nuclear fuel from them and then burn that in a light water reactor. What about the nasties, the strontium and the iodine? They have very short half-lives. They're responsible for the heat load and toxicity of spent fuel. You separate them out, you cover them with concrete, and in 100 years they have less radioactivity than fly ash. So it's a very straightforward way of dealing with the compositions that are nasty. Now you still have some stuff left, but it's one one hundredth of the heat load and toxicity of the spent fuel. And frankly, you put it at WIP in Carlsbad, New Mexico, the salt will form around it and it'll seal it forever. You don't need Yucca Mountain. The Yucca Mountain was simply taking the spent fuel and stuffing it in the ground. Well, why not use the energy that's there and use separation methods? This is something that our country has eschewed for 30 years, but I su suggest that it's time to go back and take another look at it. Um, it's the only way I know to make the nuclear industry whole and give it a future. And something we know how to do, separation chemistry is not as trivial as I indicated, but again, we're fully capable of working through what needs to be done. The difficulty is, all of our radiochemists are 30 years older than they were, and there are very few young people that have gone into the field because we don't do any separations. And so we do not have the people power to actually take that on. The irony is we would have to import people who know how to do radiochemistry to do what we knew how to do and invented 30 years ago. So let me conclude then with the five game changers. Carbon capture and storage, I've given you one method that conceivably could reduce the cost to make it somewhat economical. I think people would pay 10% more for their electricity if they could be convinced that it's carbon free. Electrical energy storage requires a new kind of battery concept. We're fully capable of developing it, but we need to get moving on it and attempt it. Plant cellulose to fuels, it's going to be tough because nature's had four billion years on us and we're going to have to figure out a way to get at that cellulose. Artificial photosynthesis to me is one of the most exciting opportunities. The things I showed you are very suggestive of approaches that we might follow and produce hydrogen. And what I learned here from your engineering faculty is that it's possible to build a turbine to generate electricity that would burn pure hydrogen. I didn't know that before I came here, but just think what you could do then if you were able to produce carbon-free hydrogen. Not only could you reduce the footprint of chemical plants, you could produce electricity carbon-free. And there's a lot of sunlight with which to work. So the game changer is clear. A small problem <laughs> is to find that material that would enable you to separate the electron hole pair and do the catalysis. And finally, recycling spent fuel. We used to do it. There's no reason why we can't get back in. And that would enable us to give the nuclear energy world a future in our country. It really is enhancing nature to achieve energy security. Thank you very much. So Dr. Orbach will be happy to respond to questions. If you have them, please use the microphones. Dr. Orbach, uh, we're honored by your presence. We're glad you had a second chance to uh, come to UPEP. Now, uh, you've just, uh, given a very uh, thorough presentation of the, uh, of the deal breakers and uh, game changers uh, of, a, of a technical nature. But uh, I wondered what your opinion is of a, of a deal breaker, which I've seen uh, operate in several cycles uh, of, uh, of uh, energy innovation, uh, alternative energy in innovation. Uh, now, venture capital has, has, has produced a tremendous amount.
amount of advances, particularly during the last uh, government administration, which was not as friendly to uh, alternative energy uh, stimulus as, as some people would, would have liked to see. Now, uh, every time the uh, price of oil gets up around $100 a barrel, you get a tremendous influx of venture capital into uh, every phase of, uh, of uh, development and producing the infrastructure for alternative energy. And then you get a sudden bust, and these companies go broke. The people have trained for uh, invested their uh, their time into this uh, process, and they and they uh, have to uh, find themselves out of work. And it's not just the cycles of supply and demand. It seems to me that speculation, particularly in oil futures, which benefits only a handful of people has been responsible for, for a lot of this. I'd like to hear what, what your uh, opinion is on the importance of, of this speculation, if it's being recognized and addressed, what you would do about it. Thank you. Well, first of all, your characterization of the last administration, I would quarrel with you on. They were the ones that... I it... didn't uh, agree with that, but I just had to uh, let you know... I know. I, I figured that out. <laughs> but you need to know where I'm coming from, too. As a, and of course, I have a, a reason for that. I was in the last administration. Um, the issue of the price of oil is one that you correctly identified, because it has, uh, some of you may remember after the oil shock of 73 and 80, uh, we had all kinds of investment, you're correct, in alternatives. And then the price of oil went down, everybody went bankrupt, and that was it. Unfortunately, that was it. We should have kept going one way or another because, frankly, the price of oil, I don't believe, is entirely due to speculation. I think it's due to business cycles. When the price goes up, we produce more oil. When the price goes down, we don't produce more oil. You saw that with natural gas. An old wise head said, when natural gas is $13 a million cubic feet, you will discover more natural gas than you ever imagined. And right now, at $4 uh, a million uh, BTU, uh, they've really stopped drilling in uh, many of the wells because it's just not economical. So you have a cycle, but you're correct. The cycle can wipe you out uh, in these alternatives. I think the issue is CO2. I think if you make a decision that you're going to go after energy that does not produce CO2, you solve the oil issue. Because no matter what the price of oil is, it produces 80% of the CO2 that coal does. And so if you move away from CO2 producing liquids, you've got a shot at avoiding those up and down shocks. Now, that's my opinion, uh, but I think it's the CO2 issue that, that people have to focus on. It's not renewables, it's not alternatives, it's the CO2 balance, because to me, that's the danger that our planet is in. Yes, I have a question about carbon sequestration. Uh, in your presentation, you didn't mention the possibility of storing liquid carbon dioxide at the bottom of the deep sea. As you probably are aware, liquid CO2 is more compressible than seawater, and if you push liquid CO2 down about a mile in the ocean, it will just go to the bottom and stay there for a long, long time. Why is that not being considered just as viable as pushing CO2 down into the earth under very high pressure? Well, thank you. We did consider that in DOE. Um, the problem is that the bottom of the ocean is not a desert. There's all kinds of life that we are discovering uh, on the ocean floor. And we chose not to pursue it because, frankly, we didn't know what to do if, in fact, the critters that were living there didn't like the CO2 that we were dumping on top of them. Uh, there were other, you know, this, the ocean absorbs a huge amount of CO2, and the amount we put in the air is something like 5% of what goes in and out of the ocean. And there was also suggestions of putting iron filings uh, in the ocean and absorbing the CO2. The problem is, once you do that, you can't reverse it. 
And we're just terribly worried about the ecological consequences of pumping liquid CO2 into the ocean. I'm not saying it won't work. It will. You are correct. But, you know, the, the life on this planet is much more complex than I think we often give credit for. And there's an awful lot of, of what we would call life down at the bottom of the ocean. And we're just worried. The acidity that you create when you start pumping CO2 changes the nature of the environment. And we were frankly afraid to go forward. First of all, I want to uh, welcome the next Golden Bear here, 1976 and you're 1960, so welcome to El Paso. <laughs> uh, I've got really two questions. Um, one is, um, of these game changers, um, it appears like the United States took the wrong direction, at least in my estimation, when they decided to go away from nuclear simply because of fear tactics by environmentalists. And when I worked with General Electric Nuclear, we had a, a phrase called uh, the caveman syndrome. And, you know, if they would have discovered natural gas today, people would be afraid to use it. In the same manner, when the caveman came up with the fire, when he didn't know how to use it for his uses, he was afraid of it. And I think the same thing exists today, is that a lot of fear has been brought into this community of the United States, whereas the rest of the world has recognized the true value of nuclear energy. So I have two questions. One is, if you were a betting man of those five, which one would you choose? And the second question? And the second one <laughs> is, how do you turn this country around <laughs> <laughs> to really see the, the, the real virtue of uh, nuclear energy? Well, first of all, I think you're unfair to the caveman, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, Three Mile Island is blamed often for the scare. And indeed, as you well know, the nuclear industry has really gotten good on safety. And so not once did I talk about safety of reactors. They are safe. We know how to run them. There's just no issue. France has been doing nuclear energy. 85% of the electricity from France is nuclear. And uh, you know they've done it in a very smart way that we have not. But I, I, to me, safety is just no longer on the table. It's, it's really quite wonderful uh, what the operators have been able to accomplish. Now, how do you convince the public of that? I think CO2 is making a difference. If you'll notice, the um, environmental groups are split now. That was not the case when you were at GO, GE. Uh, there are many in the environmental group who recognize the only way we're going to produce electricity without CO2 is through nuclear. They're not thrilled about it, but they have accepted the safe operation of nuclear reactors. The problem is the spent fuel. You've got to do something about it. Now, we don't have to do it today because spent fuel is just stored locally in the ne next to the reactor in pools, and it's fine. I think as dangerous as the devil if, uh, to terrorism and so on, but you know, we can figure that out too. But at some point, you've got to invest in how to deal with it. And so, uh, to me, that's the issue for nuclear. But the, another problem we have is the one that you know very well. Namely, when we stopped, we lost the capability of, of building. Westinghouse was purchased by Hitachi. Um, and... Uh, and GE is, is they teamed up with Arriva? No, Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi, okay. I don't remember who they're team. Anyway, uh, we've really lost that capability. So how would I convince the public? I think just by talking about it, telling the truth. And all they got to do is look around. I think there's been a tremendous change. Uh, to me, the, the real evidence for that is Britain. If you think it was bad here, you should try Britain. And now the government has announced a major initiative for nuclear, and they're going to go forward with, I think, at least half a dozen uh, new nuclear reactors. Not only is there no public uh, complaint, there actually is public support, very strong support. And I believe the same thing would be true here. The President of the United States, in his State of the Union address, 
spoke about going nuclear. I almost fell off my chair. Um, that was a strong statement. And indeed, he had a proliferation meeting uh, this, this week where the issue was not nuclear. The issue was proliferation and trying to figure out a way to avoid that and still go nuclear. I have a very good friend who's the head, is the equivalent of the Secretary of Energy in France, and he, he was with uh, Sarkozy at the uh, summit, and he wrote me an email saying that it was just wonderful to see the nations of the world come together and express support for nuclear energy and a path forward to avoid proliferation. I think we're coming around. I certainly hope so. Dr. Arbach, a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, as an observer, it seems to me that hydrogen would be the greatest feature. I guess it's the most plentiful substance on Earth. And if, if done correctly, it could burn cleanly and just make uh, water vapor. We can use that, especially here in West Texas. <laughs> so, uh, hydrogen has a great future, I think. But I, I wanted to talk about the nuclear side. Is there an issue with dealing with the recycled or spent fuel when that is spent? Is that an issue that needs to be addressed? Secondarily, I'm sure it can be solved. And, and nuclear is done, done in France and other countries, as you've mentioned. It seems to me it's a combination of public relations and political decision to move forward and do what's obvious and available in today's world until we find other breakthroughs. I like your comments. I agree with you. Uh, I think it's going to take leadership. And I'm hoping that President Obama will provide that leadership. He made a beginning. Uh, it's very clever, actually, what he's done. That conference on proliferation may be a way of avoiding that problem for a nuclear world using fuel. The, the point you made about uh, what happens when the fuel runs out is a very important one. Uh, the price of uranium went up by a factor of seven. It's now gone down by a factor of two. It's been oscillating. But at some point, uranium will become very expensive. And yet there is an answer for that. And it's really one the French have pioneered in. You've got to give them credit. They just are able to look 40 years into the future. We seem to be only able to plan a year ahead, of, uh, one year at a time. They, are, they have the following scenario. There's plenty of uranium now. But if we start building new reactors and the world starts building 50 to 100 to 200 new reactors, at some point, the uranium is going to be expensive. And so what they're going to do is they're going to build a fast spectrum reactor. That'll sound familiar to you. It's called Clinch River. We invented the fast spectrum reactor. It's American. And when I was head of the Office of Science, we killed the last one. We drilled holes in the ATR at Hanford in order to make sure that there was no more fast reactors in the United States. Unfortunately, I didn't know about it. I don't know if I could have done anything to stop it. I can't figure out why we did that. Why do we not only shoot ourselves in the foot, we do other actions on ourselves that are harmful to our body. When Clinch River went down, and that was a Carter decision, a nuclear engineer decision, we were out of the game. The French are developing, I think it'll be a sodium-cooled fast reactor, but it may be a different design. It will take them 20 years. By the time you have a new fuel that you have to license and all of the safety factors, it takes 20 years to build a new reactor. They will then burn those elements I talked about from spent fuel. They will burn for energy. Now, at some point, we're going to run out, just as you said. Then they will turn it into a breeder, because it's the same reactor. And they'll take 238, of which there's lots, you know, just 7 tenths of a percent is all we've taken away for the 235. And they'll breed plutonium. And that will be it. I mean, 10,000 years 
worth of fuel available. And so it is possible to break out of the end of uranium by just doing with, guess who invented the breeder? what the United States did 40 years ago. This may really seem painful to you. <laughs> I, it, if you were to destroy our prospects uh, with a foreign power, you couldn't do any better than what we did to ourselves over these past 30 years. Personal opinion, but I mean, really dumb. Did we do the same thing to ourselves with fusion? <laughs> I have a much more positive attitude towards fusion, as you well know, <laughs> Russ. Russ uh, is referring to the ITER project. Um, fusion, which I didn't talk about here, um, because I think the game changer is on the way. Fusion is doing what the sun does. Did you notice how much of this nature does? The reason we have any warmth in our Earth at all is because of the uranium fission. Well, the reason that we exist is because of nuclear fusion in the center of our sun, where you take, and trivially, two hydrogen uh, nuclei and fuse them to helium. The amount of energy coming out is what heats our Earth. And it's been pretty stable, and looks like we got another four or five billion years before it does something awful. So why can't we do that here on Earth? Well, of course, the small problem is that it's rather hot. In order to overcome the Coulomb repulsion, a positive nucleus and a positive nucleus, you have to get them going fast enough that they'll get close enough to fuse. That takes about 100 million degrees. That's pretty hot. You're not going to find any way to hold that together unless you use magnetic fields. This is something we've been pursuing for decades. We now are at the point where we think we know how to do it. And seven parties have come together to build about a seven-story high reactor called ITER in Cotterache, France. It's the first truly international, large-scale scientific project in the history of the world. You have the United States. You have the European Union. Let's see if I get the numbers right. We have Russia. We have India. We have China. We have South Korea, and we have Japan, all working together with, I don't want to go into the details of the difficulties, working together to build this thing. They are now, they've broken ground, and we are in the process of building it. My guess is that it'll be finished about 2020, so that's roughly 10 years from now. It'll run for five years, six years. It will bring together deuterium and tritium and fuse them into helium and give you an extra neutron that has the energy. The only thing coming out of the tailpipe is helium. If you don't like the helium, it'll escape the Earth's atmosphere and go away anyway. But it'll produce the power of the sun. It's a real possibility. And we are now talking about, say, 2030, building a demo which would actually be a demonstration fusion reactor. So I think fusion is real. 20 years away before we know, not the 40 or 50 that people kept talking about. What's really wonderful is over half the population of the world is represented in those seven parties that have agreed to build this thing. It's very exciting. And um, with some kind of luck, we might get there. On that very optimistic note, I want to thank you again very, very thank much you, for being with us. And <laughs>As we always do, we have a reception just outside the uh, um, room here, and I hope that you will continue your conversations and interact informally with Dr. Orbach. Thank you again.